element sulfur occurs in several allotropic forms, of which at least two are common and well known. We are now looking at crystals of rhombic sulfur. These crystals have been obtained by dissolving a small quantity of sulfur in some carbon disulfide, filtering the solution, and then permitting the carbon disulfide to evaporate on a watch glass. The two or three small crystals in the red circle illustrate the rhombic form of sulfur quite clearly. The rhombic crystals of sulfur, which you just saw, are the stable form at room temperature. We can cause another form of crystals to be formed at somewhat higher temperature, however. In this test tube, I've placed several grams of sulfur and have then melted this sulfur over the Bunsen burner. The sulfur is now liquid and at a temperature somewhat above its melting point. We'll now pour this molten sulfur into this funnel. We'll then permit the liquid sulfur partially to crystallize, and then we'll pour off the still liquid portion and examine the crystals remaining in the funnel. The liquid sulfur, which we poured into the funnel, cooled and solidified. But before it had completely solidified, we poured out the balance of the still liquid sulfur, leaving this mass of sulfur, which had crystallized around the edge of the funnel. This mass was then removed from the funnel and broken in half so that you could see the many needle-like crystals of monoclinic sulfur which had formed inside the funnel. Monoclinic sulfur is the stable form at temperatures above about 95 or 96 degrees. And since the melted sulfur was above this temperature and began to solidify above this temperature, monoclinic crystals were formed. If these crystals are permitted to stand at room temperature, they slowly change to the rhombic form, which is the stable form below 95 degrees. As this change takes place, the sulfur remains in the needle-like form, but the needles themselves become opaque due to the formation of many thousands of tiny crystals of rhombic sulfur, uh, which are formed from the monoclinic sulfur. This form of sulfur, then, the monoclinic form that you see, is only temporarily stable at room temperatures and will eventually change to the rhombic form. It's easily identified, however, by means of the characteristic needle-like appearance of the crystal. The sulfur in this test tube has been heated to a very high temperature. In fact, the sulfur is now boiling. Now, when sulfur is heated to this high a temperature and then rapidly cooled, a third form of solid sulfur is formed. I'm going to cool this sulfur rapidly by pouring the very hot sulfur into this beaker of cold water. The sulfur that we get by rapidly cooling sulfur near its boiling point has the appearance which you now see. This sulfur is no longer hard, but is instead flexible and rather rubbery. Sulfur in this form is called amorphous sulfur or rubbery sulfur. You can see that it has some stretch and the ability to retract when released after being stretched. This is really a super cooled liquid and it will slowly revert to the crystal form, which is stable at room temperature, the rhombic form. This uh, transition takes some time, however, and won't be complete for quite a number of days at least. In the meantime, the sulfur will slowly lose the rubbery properties that it has now and will become more and more brittle. We turn now to the gas which is formed when hydrogen and sulfur are united, hydrogen sulfide. We wish to study the laboratory methods for the preparation of this gas and several characteristic reactions of it. In each of these test tubes, I've placed a small quantity of sodium sulfide solution. Sodium sulfide is soluble in water 
and contains a rather high concentration of the sulfide ion. To the tube on the left, I'm going to add a few milliliters of dilute sulfuric acid. You'll notice that a gas bubbles from the solution. And when we lower a piece of lead acetate paper into the region above this tube, the lead acetate paper turns black. This is a test, as we have seen previously, for the presence of hydrogen sulfide. To the middle tube, I'll add a few milliliters of dilute hydrochloric acid. and the same result is obtained. To the third tube, we'll add a small quantity of acetic acid. And once again, the lead acetate paper is darkened. This experiment shows, then, that hydrogen sulfide is a weaker acid than sulfuric or hydrochloric or acetic acid, since these acids liberate it from solutions of its salt. In order to prepare some hydrogen sulfide for further experiments, we've set up a small generator. In the Erlenmeyer flask, I've placed some iron sulfide, ferrous sulfide. Through the thistle tube, we'll add some dilute hydrochloric acid. You can see some bubbles rising in the flask. Hydrogen sulfide gas is being produced. It will pass over and be collected by the upward displacement of air, since it's slightly heavier than air. We will collect a total of three bottles in this way, and then use them for further experiments on hydrogen sulfide. The next experiment will test the solubility of hydrogen sulfide in water, and in sodium hydroxide solution. In this beaker, we've placed some sodium hydroxide solution and some water to dilute it, and I've added a few drops of phenophthalein to impart a pink color. This beaker contains water. We'll place a bottle of hydrogen sulfide in each of the beakers. And agitate to bring the gas and the liquid in the beaker in contact. You'll notice that the sodium hydroxide solution rather rapidly rises in the bottle. This indicates that hydrogen sulfide is an acid. In the other bottle, the gas has dissolved to a very limited extent. You can see that water has risen into the neck of the bottle, but the contrast between this bottle and the sodium hydroxide uh, solution is marked. From this experiment, then, we can conclude that hydrogen sulfide is slightly soluble in water. Actually, its solutions are about one-tenth normal. But that the gas, because of its acid character, is quite soluble in solutions which are basic. We tested solutions of sodium sulfide with several different acids. And we found that it didn't make any difference whether the acid, the source of these hydrogen ions, was hydrochloric or sulfuric, or acetic acid. In any of the three cases, the acid was strong enough to cause hydrogen sulfide to be liberated from a solution of sodium sulfide. We tested for the hydrogen sulfide using a solution of lead acetate on filter paper. The lead acetate paper turned black due to the precipitation of lead sulfide. We then set up a generator utilizing the reaction between ferrous sulfide and hydrochloric acid produce hydrogen sulfide and, of course, the ferrous ion. We then tested the solubility of hydrogen sulfide in water and in sodium hydroxide solution. We saw that hydrogen sulfide was only slightly soluble in water, but that in sodium hydroxide solutions, hydrogen sulfide dissolved rapidly because it reacted with the sodium hydroxide 
forming sodium sulfide and water. One of the bottles of hydrogen sulfide gas that we collected uh, from our generator has been placed mouth to mouth with a bottle of oxygen gas. The two bottles have been allowed to remain in this position for several minutes. We'll now test the reaction of hydrogen sulfide with oxygen by removing the top bottle from the bottom and then attempting to ignite the mixture in both bottles. You should notice that the hydrogen sulfide oxygen mixture burned with a flash of blue flame, and also that the bottles are now coated with a thin film of sulfur. We will explain the appearance of this sulfur when we discuss the equations involved in this reaction. A solution of hydrogen sulfide gas and water is called hydrogen sulfide water. The liquid in this uh, bottle has been prepared by bubbling a steady stream of hydrogen sulfide gas through distilled water. This solution is very useful. We will illustrate a number of its reactions. I've placed a small quantity of this solution in this test tube. One of the properties of hydrogen sulfide water is its activity as a reducing agent. So we'll try it with a number of different oxidizing agents. On this spatula, I've placed several crystals of iodine. We'll add these crystals to the hydrogen sulfide water and shake. And you'll notice that the solution rapidly becomes milky in appearance. The milkiness is caused by very finely divided free sulfur, which is formed in the reaction between the iodine and the hydrogen sulfide. The other product of the reaction is hydrogen iodide. We will now examine the reaction between acidified hydrogen sulfide water and potassium dichromate solution. In the test tube, we've placed a few milliliters of our hydrogen sulfide water, which we've just prepared. To this hydrogen sulfide water, I'll add a small quantity of dilute sulfuric acid. We'll now add the potassium dichromate solution you should notice that the dichromate ion has an orange color. You should then observe the color change that takes place as the reaction proceeds. First, you should notice that the orange color of the potassium dichromate solution has changed to green. This greenish color is characteristic of the chromium 3 plus ion. You should also notice that the solution has become milky. This milky appearance is due to the presence of millions of tiny particles of elementary sulfur, which have been formed as the hydrogen sulfide was oxidized by the dichromate. When we ignited the mixture of hydrogen sulfide and oxygen, some of the hydrogen sulfide burned according to this equation, yielding sulfur dioxide and water. You observe, though, that this equation requires two volumes of hydrogen sulfide and three volumes of oxygen, or a little more oxygen than hydrogen sulfide, one and a half times as much. Now, in our reaction, we used equal volumes of hydrogen sulfide and oxygen, so that not quite enough oxygen was present uh, to provide the oxygen necessary for this reaction. So some of the hydrogen sulfide burned according to this equation which is the equation for hydrogen sulfide burning in a deficiency of oxygen. And this yields sulfur and water. And this equation accounts for some of the sulfur which we saw deposited on the sides of the bottle. Later, we saw that hydrogen sulfide water reacts with iodine to produce sulfur and solutions containing hydrogen iodide. And then we saw that acidified Solutions of a dichromate react with hydrogen sulfide water to produce sulfur and the green chromic ion and water. And you observe that there are 14 hydrogens present in the seven molecules of water. Eight of these came from the sulfuric acid which we added and the other six from the hydrogen sulfide. 
This experiment will illustrate the use of hydrogen sulfide water as a precipitating agent. Now you know that hydrogen sulfide in water is a very weak acid. This means that the concentration of sulfide ions in its solution is very low. Before this very low concentration of sulfide ions can react with a metal ion to form an insoluble sulfide precipitate then, the metal sulfide must be very insoluble. If the metal sulfide is uh, comparatively soluble, an insufficient quantity of sulfide ions will be present to cause precipitation. In this test tube, we place some cadmium sulfate solution, in this tube some zinc sulfate, and in this tube some nickel sulfate. Now to each of these tubes, I'm going to add a few milliliters of hydrogen sulfide water. In the tube on the left, you can see the brilliant yellow precipitate of cadmium sulfide. In the tube in the middle, the white precipitate of zinc sulfide. In the tube containing the nickel ion, however, no precipitate occurs with hydrogen sulfide water. This indicates that cadmium sulfide and zinc sulfide are less soluble sulfides than is nickel. Since obviously enough sulfide ion was present in these two tubes to cause precipitation, while an insufficient quantity was present in this tube. Now a salt of hydrogen sulfide, or hydrosulfuric acid, should ionize in the normal way and provide a large concentration of sulfide ions. Ammonium sulfide is a soluble sulfide salt. And to the tube containing the nickel sulfate solution, I'll now add a few milliliters of ammonium sulfide. And instantly, the characteristic black color of nickel sulfide appears. When we have enough sulfide ions then, as we do in ammonium sulfide solution, nickel sulfide is caused to precipitate. But remember that this sulfide did not precipitate with hydrogen sulfide water, because an inadequate number of sulfide ions was present. This experiment tells us that nickel sulfide is more soluble than cadmium and zinc. But we can't tell from this experiment which of these two sulfides is the less soluble? And that the determination will be the subject of the next experiment. In this experiment, we will examine uh, solutions of cadmium sulfate and zinc sulfate again to see which of the sulfides of these two metals is the least soluble. In this tube, I've placed some cadmium sulfate solution, and in this tube, some zinc sulfate. To each tube, I've added a drop of methyl violet indicator. This causes the purple color in the tube. Now, methyl violet is an indicator which is purple in uh, solutions that are uh, less acid than about 3 tenths normal. It goes through a greenish color at about 3 tenths normal acid and becomes yellow in solutions that are more acid than 3 tenths normal. I'll add a few drops of hydrochloric acid to each tube and stir. This produces a bluish green color in this tube. And finally, the green color. And we can produce the same color in the zinc sulfate too. The hydrogen ion concentration in these two tubes is now about 3 tenths normal. Now to each tube, we'll add our hydrogen sulfide water as before. The cadmium sulfide still precipitates. But no precipitate of zinc sulfide is obtained. This result is obtained because the presence of the hydrochloric acid has so reduced the ionization of the hydrogen sulfide that very, very few sulfide ions are present in the acidified solutions. In fact, not enough sulfide ions to cause the precipitation of zinc sulfide. Cadmium sulfide, however, is so insoluble 
that an ample number of sulfide ions is present to cause it to precipitate. This experiment indicates then that cadmium sulfide is the most insoluble of the three sulfides that we studied, that nickel sulfide is more soluble than cadmium, but less soluble than nickel, and finally that nickel sulfide is the most soluble of the three. Hydrogen sulfide ionizes in two steps. The first producing HS minus ions and hydrogen ions, and then these HS minus ions ionize to a very small extent to produce some sulfide ions and some hydrogen ions. When hydrogen sulfide is used as a precipitant, it's these few sulfide ions uh, that are reacting. Now this low concentration of sulfide ions is sufficient, as we saw, to cause the precipitation of cadmium sulfide and of zinc sulfide. So therefore, the product of the concentration of the cadmium ion times the sulfide ion concentration must be greater than the solubility product constant for cadmium sulfide. And the same thing must be true for zinc sulfide, since both of these sulfides precipitate. However, we saw that with the nickel ion, hydrogen sulfide did not cause the precipitation of nickel sulfide. Therefore, an insufficient quantity of sulfide ions were present, and no nickel sulfide was obtained. This, in turn, must mean that the product of the concentration of the nickel ion and the sulfide ion was less than the solubility product constant for nickel sulfide. Then we studied the reactions of two of these ions, cadmium and zinc, in three-tenths normal acid solution, the acid being hydrochloric acid. Now, in a three-tenths normal acid solution, the hydrogen ion concentration is fairly large, and therefore the ionization of the HS minus ions is repressed, and fewer sulfide ions are present. Under those circumstances, there was still a sufficient quantity of sulfide ion to cause the precipitation of cadmium sulfide, however. So this concentration of the cadmium ion times the concentration of the sulfide ion must still have been larger than the solubility product constant for cadmium sulfide. With zinc ion, however, no precipitate occurred under these conditions, so that we can see that the reduced sulfide ion concentration made small by the presence of the acid, was in fact so small that its concentration times the zinc ion concentration was now less than the solubility product constant for zinc sulfide. In this film, then, we've studied some of the crystal forms exhibited by sulfur. We've studied the preparation of hydrogen sulfide from ferrous sulfide. We've examined some of its chemical and physical properties and its use as an analytical reagent.